Welcome to the Blizzard Film Department. This is the team responsible for all the incredible cinematics that we see in every Blizzard game. Non-interactive cinematic sequences have been an important part of every game since Warcraft Orcs and Humans. With Cataclysm, the team has created some of the most amazing cinematics yet. The opening cinematic for Cataclysm is basically a disaster movie. When we saw the effects cinematic and storyboard for my CG supervisor and myself, we both laughed a lot and just sort of looked at it and said, yeah, that's funny, where's, where's the real cinematic, you know, good joke, but uh, seriously. Every shot has some sort of destruction or some sort of force or some sort of earthquake or wave or something going on. Having all these sets that we got to pull apart, I thought, well, that's just going to be easy. Um, and I was wrong. We were concerned about not necessarily getting it done, but just sort of how it would all come together. Uh, once we realized that that was actually the cinematic and got over gasping and so forth, looking at it and trying to figure out what was going to be the most challenging was realizing that the biggest thing was going to be just the sheer number of effects that we had to do for the show. But I think we were all pretty fairly confident that we would find a way to accommodate that and keep the scope of it manageable. It turned out to be a fun project just to have modeling build all these crazy sets and then set it up so animators could tear it to the ground. From a visual storytelling perspective, uh, we wanted to show the darkening of the world. Uh, we wanted it to feel really ominous. So when we first see Azeroth up top, you know, the sun is out, it's glorious, we showcase the beauty of the world. And then progressively, as we go through the scene, the sun gets lower in the sky, the world gets dimmer, so that by the time that Deathwing shows up on the gates of Stormwind, the sky's gone dark, the fire has spread in around the gates and is giving us sort of an echo of that hellish environment that we started with. Try to give the audience a sense of uh, progression of all the events that happened in the show and hopefully to sell the scale and epicness of the whole whole thing that's going on and also set up the momentum for you know the future events that will happen in the game. Initially, we also wanted to introduce our new playable races, the Goblins and the Worgen. We were very excited about bringing those characters to life. We had storyboarded scenes of the Goblins evacuating their uh, erupting island, and the Worgen were gonna spill out of Gilneas as the Grey Main Wall falls down. It was gonna be really cool, but then reality intruded because um, we realized that the sheer scope of the disaster effects uh, was uh, so labor intensive that we were gonna to have to make some hard choices about what we wanted to include. Um, so we ended up refocusing on the core story, which was Deathwing devastates Azeroth. And when we did that, it became pretty clear that um, uh, as cool as those character reveals would be, um, that was the sort of thing that could be handled very well in gameplay, and that it was probably better for us to leave those introductions to the game itself. One of our bigger jobs was just deciding what lands we were going to break. The wonderful thing about working on something like World of Warcraft is you have a very established um, set of environments. The game team was very helpful in that regard. They gave us a lot to choose from, and then we worked with them to kind of whittle that list down. So many different environments, and then having those environments be interactive enough to be destroyed. Every environment piece that we saw in the foreground and a bunch in the background had to be destroyed. So it was a kind of an environment-driven production rather than a character-driven production. It's a lot different than animating characters, um, but it doesn't mean that you can't put a lot of character into it. Our big priorities were that um, we find places that were very iconic and recognizable to the players. And um, also, you know, we wanted both Alliance and Horde territories to be represented. You look at Stormwind and Darkshore and Loch Madan. For a player, it's a lot like being able to say, oh, look, it's the Eiffel Tower, or look, it's, you know, the Pyramid of Giza, or, oh, look, it's the Statue of Liberty. It is really that iconic for them. We went through a lot of iteration uh, to, uh, to capture the essence of those places, um, but uh, also ground them in this sort of heightened reality. You know, there's a really intense uh, prospect trying to make all that work. Our effects team had to jump onto that just as soon as they possibly could 
just to be able to finish on time. And they had way more work than we did. Like everybody else. Realizing that the effects were going from more of a atmospheric or look and feel type thing, going to more of a centralized character was going to be very be a very big challenge for our group. We had mountains of water and skies full of fire. A lot of smokes, uh, sparks, lava effects, dripping lavas, uh, glowing mouth, anything you can think of. We tried a, a variety of different approaches with the fire for Deathwing. His size and scope of the areas that he's traveling over is enormous. Deathwing is a really big dragon. He's like airliner big, right? He might be traveling as much, I think, in the dark shore shot, as much as a mile away from camera and swooping over that in less than a minute. That presents its own unique challenges in terms of portraying that kind of scale. I was very afraid on a, on a more macro level that we would build a fire or build smoke or embers or what have you, and that we would not be able to convey how big he really is. We definitely went for a more particle sprite-based solution initially because that seemed to be uh, the right sort of choice given the distance that we're working, but it wasn't really giving us the look that we wanted or the feel of uh, Deathwing sort of fire curtain and that magical sort of fire that follows him wherever he goes. So we ended up actually going to a fluid sim. It was one of the largest fluid sims we've ever attempted. We actually had to up the memory on many of our boxes to make sure that we'd actually be able to meet the requirements of the, and the detail level that we really wanted to make. Another challenging shot was Deathwing emerging from the lava. We were seeing many, many different parts of the body throughout the entire shot, and we have to sell the weight the whole time along the way. We used to call that shot the palm olive shot uh, because he has his fingers in a, in a bowl of lava. His nails are being done as he pulls his hand out of that lava and smashes it down on the rock. Overall, Deathwing's texturing and his look has just been a benefit for us. It was really made our jobs a lot easier. One of the real pleasures of doing Cataclysm was getting to design Deathwing himself. We knew that we were going to see him from all angles, so he needed to be believable from all angles. So we give him the full treatment. I saw the concepts and uh, the 2D animatics, so I got a good sense of you know what the dragon was about. And uh, I thought it was really cool. He has this like inner like evil energy inside of him that's like bursting out. He is so full of molten fury that um, he needs a metal exoskeleton, essentially, to hold himself together. And so in addition to the neck and spine plates, which were more established uh, in lore, we needed to make like metal staples, basically. I kind of saw it as metal stitches, uh, kind of like holding them together, and there's like lava trying to seep out of it. My first impression, yeah, I, I thought uh, he looked really cool, and I was pretty excited to, to realize him, or we to realize him from uh, 2D to 3D. When it came to rigging uh, Deathwing, we used the same character TD that we used for Cindergosa from Wrath of the Lich King. And um, what that did for us was it allowed us to get a character up and running very quickly based on that, the previous techniques that we had used. We need to do a series of poses thinking about all the different locomotion that he might be doing, uh, such as flying or climbing or walking. We put him on all these different poses and we consider the anatomy and the limb lengths. He sure deforms correctly, especially around the neck area. He had like really extreme poses of straight and also the S-curve. So we wanted to make sure that when it deformed, it would look good in both angles. In the end, it's really the best way that we need to tell the story. You know, how, do, how is Deathwing gonna look and move in order to tell a story? Deathwing is a very complicated character, let me say that. Deathwing is a very complicated character, both to model and to animate and uh, I was tremendously impressed at how our team was able to bring him to life.